Another day of postseason games in the books here. It's the Just Baseball Show, and we've got a couple games to recap and some series to discuss. I'm Arm Waiting. He's Peter Apple. And as always, Peter, this podcast is brought to you by Bet MGM, the king of sports books. Sign up and deposit into your newly created account using promo code Just Baseball. Download the Bet MGM Sports app on iOS or Android or visit betmgm.com. Place your first bet offer and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if it loses. If the bet does lose, your bonus bets will be available once the wager is settled. Gambling problem? Call or text 1 800 Gambler. Must be 21 or older, and terms and conditions apply. I like what we're doing here, Aram. Episode one of kind of the playoff recaps. Jack led you through his one note, some mm-hmm. detailed, nice bullet points. Yesterday, I went farther than bullet points. I was straight my conscious. It was everything I was thinking in each at bat almost. And now we're back to just some detailed, good bullet points. We need to kind of separate it from my insaneness. Yeah, I, and I think I'm a good middle ground between you and Jack because I have a little bit of the craziness and then a little bit of the boring like broadcaster guy in me. So it works I mean, out. Yeah, I called Jack a pussy on the podcast yesterday. Yeah, I, I heard agree. that. I saw that on the staff chat, and may, I'm like, I got I, I bookmarked the episode now. I got to go back and watch. I'm anytime I hear Jack slander, I'm gonna go tune back in. I mean, with all due respect to Jack, he was being a pussy because he was he was talking about how two fan bases were coming at him, so he didn't want to give takes anymore. That he was just kind of gonna sit on the sidelines, and I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, this is our job to just piss off everybody. Yeah. I've been pissing yeah. off fan bases left and right well, every single time I bet against a team. That entire fan base thinks I hate them. I keep seeing, yeah, like stop betting against the Astros. I see those comments all the time. I, every single time. It's not going all that well so far. It's fair, and we're gonna talk about that. But I mean, that's what comes with the territory of like, hey, we're gonna talk about something before it happens and discuss what we think is gonna happen. It's either gonna be right or wrong. And if it's wrong, you know the other team, you know, the fans of the other team are going to come and dunk. And you know what? They should dunk. Have fun. Revel in it. Have a blast. And I will say, I think Rangers fans are having a blast right now. We're recording this right at about 1020 Eastern time. So it's the top of the eighth inning. Generally, we like to wait till the postseason games are over or decided. This one seems all but decided. We'll start with the Astros game since it's concluded. And I also have a one note that is currently happening that no one cares about except for me, but maybe there's some other nerds out there that's going to care. But let's start with Astros twins because that was a game that I was really excited for. Um, I thought it would deliver a little bit differently and that's why we love the postseason. It it didn't. (laughs) Nine to one, Astros take it. And it seemed like the first inning a couple, you know, a couple bounces really ended up kind of determining the game. Kirilov misplays the ball down the line at first, and then a couple different dominoes. All of a sudden, Jose Abreu hits one four forty two, which you know we talk about like what we actually think that was stat cast wise. I don't believe that was four forty two. I think that was four eighty. But yeah, I, that I wrote, kind of, at that it got away at that point. I wrote down in my Google Doc, Peter Vision had that at five oh five. Um, and Peter Vision is normally what I like to do. But Aram, you and I both know this. I think Twins fans know this. I think Astros fans know this. The game was over after the first inning. Because yeah. that ball, Kirloff misses that ball. If he turns two, it's 0-0 going in the bottom of the first. But regardless, even if it was 0-0, the Twins were not scoring once Javier hit the mound. Classic Christian Javier in the playoffs. Jeff Passan had a really funny tweet about it. Christian Javier has regressed in the postseason. Instead of a starting a combined no-hitter, he allowed one hit. He is just a different animal. And I do want to give him all the credit in the world because his fastball had insane amounts of life. His slider was unbelievable. I love that he was getting first pitch strikes with that curveball just as kind of a taste breaker, saying, remember this pitch? Getting strike one early but the glare certainly didn't help. And that um, no. cam, I I mean, I'm just sitting on my fat ass on the couch just thinking, how the hell would I even, like, I, I think if you gave me a thousand tries, I couldn't get a foul ball with the yeah. way he was playing with the glare. I mean, yeah, th- those shadows. And we, we like, you hear that you know, about how shadows can really affect hitters. And it, you could just see some of the swings that they were getting, uh, that he was getting were just, he gets ugly swings, Javier does, but there was just a different level of loss that some of these hitters looked. But to be fair, and what Astros fans are going to say is, hey, you know, 
the, the shadows didn't go away for us. And exactly. that was the case. I mean, they put good swings on balls. And and that was the thing that really stood out to me is, yeah, the, there seemed to be a level of discomfort, even at times with some Astro swings where you're like, oh, they didn't really see the ball there. But they were able to lock in. And again, this is a team that's been there, done that. I think they've played high leverage games with shadows. They've had weird situations where they've had to try to figure it out. But what, what really stood out to me is you talk about that first inning, I didn't think that Sonny Gray looked bad. Otherwise, really, it was it was that big home run to to Jose Abreu, you know, one other solo shot to Bregman. And other than that, it, it was fine. It was four innings. It was four earned five, five total runs, but six K's one walk. You know, the it box, wasn't great. The box score looks way worse than it was when you watched the game. I think if it weren't for I mean, again, of course, you could take the bad thing that happened. It's always going to be better, but. I do have to wonder how things unfold if that first inning was was limited. And I don't like to pinpoint one thing because, of course, you know, they ended up tacking on at the end anyways. But do they go to Bailey Ober later on exactly. if, it's, if it's a closer game? Probably not. So it, it, it's a domino effect that would have been different. What wouldn't have changed is the fact that the Twins had three hits. And yeah. that's what stood out to me is I thought the Twins would swing it here. I did think Javier would give a quality start. And he did. And But to your point and to what you, Jeff Passon's point, this wasn't last year's Javier. He did walk five. They did have opportunities with guys on base, but the difference was Javier then walked back in, looked like last year and the year before his Javier. That slider was disgusting. I mean, the fastball was taking off, and he had a lot of confidence, even with runners in scoring position, guys on base. And that's the crazy part. Twins only had three hits, but they had a lot of opportunities with guys on base. And, I mean, you got to give Javier credit. But you also got to look at the twins and say, hey, you, you got to come through on on at least one of those or two of those opportunities there because it, the game just got away from them quickly. It was a lot of the big time hitters too coming up with runners in scoring position. How about Royce Lewis, you know, <laughs> looking like a ghost out there. But when Willie Castro squared to bunt, you knew the twins had no fucking shot up there. <laughs> I, I said it as well in the last show when Max Muncy first pitched squared to bunt against Gallon. When you're squaring to bunt, like I know Willie Castro, 33 steals. I know he's his speed, so he's just trying to make things happen. But come on. If there's there's different kinds of squares to bunt. There's the yeah. Jose Altuve, I see you playing deep. I'm going to drag one down for a hit. And then there's the, I'm not seeing the ball well. I'm going to just try to get something on the ground and steal a hit. And that's what it looked like for Willie Castro, to your to your point. What are your one notes or like your thoughts from this game? Because I honestly have way more takeaways from the the subsequent game. But the one thing for me was that, you know, this was not a disaster from Sonny Gray. And I thought more of a credit to the Astros getting their swings off. Um, of course, I, I'm, I'm going to let you talk about Jordan. And I know that that's going to be one of your big bullets there. My big takeaway here, though, was this is why the Astros signed Jose Abreu. If he performs down the stretch here, he's worth it for them. You know, yep. and, and I know that it was a disappointing regular season. But they didn't need him that badly in the regular season. They got into the playoffs. He still had some clutch hits here and there. But if he performs on the big stage, and we know that he's you know a leader, he's a guy that has just just fit like a glove for this team. That's what we said from day one. If he can help put them over the top in these big spots here, no one's talking about the contract. And maybe it might be bad in a couple of years, but it really salvages this season and probably the overall contract in a lot of ways if he can push them towards another world T uh, world series title here and today you know I, I thought that this was a statement from jose abreu you got to pitch him like he's the same jose abreu he was last year and the year before that and the year before that and the year before that because that's what he looks like right now just a bona fide run producer he you know he's built to drive in runs and for all those watching on youtube arms wearing his marlin's quarter zip first of all if you're watching on youtube hit that subscribe button how about the like button and comment if we said anything crazy so far, and we're probably going to get crazier as the episode goes along. Moving off Yuli Gurriel, right? Yeah. Yuli Gurriel <laughs> didn't seem to have much in the tank anymore. No. Astros identified that, and they got Jose Abreu, and Astros fans and the front office is probably thinking, all we need is a couple big hits from you in October because our lineup is going to get us there. And it did take to the last game and a Mariners win over the Rangers for them to win the division. Yeah. The Astros are simply inevitable, like what <laughs> Thanos said in Avengers. Yeah. I am inevitable. So a couple takeaways. Another one from Passan. Christian Javier. Uh, this was earlier on in his start when he was just dominating. 
thrown 31 pitches of those 12 have been sliders. And of those, he has seven swings and misses that ties the season high on slider whiffs. And it's through two innings. Hmm. So he set his season high on sliders on whiffs. Um, a couple of things that I just wrote down as the game went along. I thought AJ Brzezinski made a really, really good point that the hit by pitch to Ryan Jeffers was huge because I bet on the twins in that game. And the reason I did is because Javier five FIP on the road, three, five FIP at home, FIP over five against lefties. And he was going up against a couple straight lefties, right? Willie Castro, then lefty heavy lineup, then Jorge Polanco. And it didn't matter. And then I also wrote down gritty Julianne walk. Few players in baseball draw walks like him. I just love what he walks. Um, I mean, it's, no, it's amazing that he can go over three with three punchies and still have a 400 OBP. That's yeah. a Julianne slump right there. Like, that's what I love. Like the Julianne slump is not, is not a slump. <laughs> no, he's, he's still getting on base and another. So I kept going through the game obviously and kept realizing, Oh, the twins lost here. The twins lost here. Two and one count. Jorge Polanco is up. Javier can't find the zone. Swing and miss on a two one ball in the dirt. Just a terrible swing. And he knew it. Javier knew it. And then it was over. And I was just so confused. Like, why are the twins, when you finally see this guy unraveling a little bit in terms of his command, right? Because unraveling for Christian Javier in the playoffs is he's just not throwing strikes. Because if he's throwing in the zone, they're not going to hit shit. Why are you giving him passes? Why are you trying to be the hero? All you should be trying to do is get on first base, just move the lineup. And yep. they were not doing it. Um, that AB to Altuve in the fourth inning, um, if you remember that one, art, right? Classic high fastball to set up the sweeper by Sonny Gray. Just complimenting the Sonny Gray outing a little bit. Altuve got a hit in his first AB, right, on that hanging sweeper because he set it up with a fastball. Just dots of 94-mile-an-hour two-seamer on him. Just a couple more notes that I have. Playoff baseball, Sonny Gray's allowed eight home runs this season. Lowest home run per nine in all of baseball. Half the amount of second place Justin Steele. He allowed two in that game. I mean, it's yeah. just, that's playoff baseball for you. And Jordan, I, you talk about inevitable. I mean, this guy is the most inevitable baseball player, I think, in the postseason right now that that we've got. And it, we, we have the conversation of, you know, how – uh, is clutch real this and that if you don't think clutch is real just look at Jordan Alvarez that said of course there's the correlation of good players tend to perform on big stages because they're always performing more than anybody else but Jordan kicks into another gear and if pitchers can kick into another gear in the postseason why is it much different for hitters because we're going to talk about Nate Evaldi in a, in a minute here who very clearly kicks into another gear. We just talked about Zach Wheeler. You and Jack did. Uh, that's a guy that clearly kicks into another gear. It's a little different because it's adrenaline. You throw harder and all those things. But there's aspects to hitting where you can just lock in on a different level and, and also just utilize some of the adrenaline on the other side to your favor and, and just not miss mistakes. And Jordan just seems to never miss mistakes. And I think there's a level of this fear that he instills in the pitcher at this point that almost works into his favor. He gets ahead and counts because pitchers have to nibble. If it's situations where, you know, he is, you can't really pitch around him. He knows it. And he's going to hit whatever strike you throw him in that at bat and in that game. And that's exactly what he's doing. Bregman again, kicks into another gear in the postseason. He comes up with a couple hits. I mean, again, I, I really feel like if Jose Abreu is swinging it the way he is right now, and if he can continue to do that, he seems like the the guy that lengthens this lineup a little bit. I got no questions about Altuve, and that was that was my note, is it, two things here. The lengthening of the lineups. I thought that was their problem at points this year, but I have no questions about Altuve, Bregman, Jordan, Tucker. I was curious what Abreu we were going to see. You know, again, Pena is there for the defense, which is another one of my notes. And, and that's kind of my point here is it seemed like it used to be a very divided lineup this year at certain points. It was like, First five, very top heavy, and then kind of fell off. But if Abreu's performing, all of a sudden, it it just seems like this lineup's a little bit longer. And it's not like Yiner Diaz is a bum. Mauricio Dubon gives you good at-bats. He had a pair of hits today. Again, Pena is your eight hitter. Uh, And and that's a guy that hasn't had the best offensive season, but he can still run into him, and you know he's there in the big moments. 
And shit, Martin Maldonado has actually been swinging it the last couple of days. I, th- this is exactly the World Series Astros. And, you know, I obviously doubted them. I still think the Twins make this a series. But my last note here on the Astros is that Jeremy Pena is as clutch of a defender as you're going to find. And this is almost a similar note where it's like Jeremy Pena is a very good defender, an elite defender. So elite defenders consistently make big plays. That said, and I know that there's nothing to back this up. It's very anecdotal. I just feel like every time there's a big moment, Peter, the ball gets ripped to Jeremy Pena and he makes an insane play. It just seems like it never fails. And that guy's heartbeat just never escalates. I love the point about is clutch real? Is it not? Because it's a very nuanced conversation. And there is a subsection of the analytics community that doesn't believe that that's a real thing. That, you know, if a guy hits 300 in the regular season and then goes three for 10 with a couple of big hits, is he clutch just because he's in the bigger moments? I see the argument. However, and it is anecdotal. I don't believe in that argument. Clutch is real. Baseball is built on momentum. We're seeing it with the Dodgers, right? The Dodgers haven't done anything in the last couple of years. Mookie Betts is three for 33 in the last 10 postseason games. And you don't think he knows that? Yeah, like that. Of course he knows that. It's building. It's mounting. It's mounting and he makes the Dodgers go. And when he doesn't go, the Dodgers don't go. Clutch is a thing. Jordan Alvarez is hitting 500 with four home runs, two doubles, and six RBIs in the postseason. Every single postseason, he does this. Now, in the regular season, right, hit 31 home runs and hit 295. It's a great year. 500 with four home runs in three games. And the Twins pitching, what have we been saying? It's fantastic, right? From top to bottom, it's not just the starters. It's the bullpen. We love all of them. That's why we were bullish, or is it bearish? We were one of those. In a Confident positive- is bullish. Bearish is, uh, is, is is skeptical. We were bullish <laughs> on the Minnesota Twins because of that. Yeah. Clutch is a thing. And I don't know if you can convince me that it isn't. And now, I again, you don't have the data to back that up. If you watch the games, at least for me, this is my own opinion, I think clutch is real. I, I think mean, there is a the zone. The Astros are clutched the, the, the top to bottom. And they've all been there, done that. And it, I think there's a level of just like, you see this team that's been there, man. And they just, they're not phased by the moment. And I, I that has to matter. If we're talking about the postseason being a different beast, if you acknowledge that it's a different beast, then you're acknowledging that clutch has to somewhat be a factor because you have to not be phased by the bigger beast. And I think this is a Twins team that, Look, they're going to be good for a while. And Correa has risen to the occasion as you know an extension of this Astros team. But you look top to bottom of this lineup, it's either a lot of youth or a lot of guys that haven't really been there. So even the guys that aren't young, like Jorge Polanco, he has not been in the postseason very much. Um, you know, even a Donovan Solano, like how many opportunities has he really had on the big stage? And Jeffers is young. Castro has been kind of a journeyman in some ways and has just turned into a really nice piece for them. Then Walner, young guy. Kirilov, young guy. Lewis, young guy. Kepler hasn't really played in the postseason much. And Julian, young guy. Um, to, to me, it's it's a twin team that I think is a little bit, you know, kind of like the Orioles, which we'll get to, which is just kind of getting their feet wet. That said, I don't think the series is over at all. I really don't. I, and I think they're going to go down with a fight. And I think they get one more here. And they, I think they can send it back to Houston for a decisive game five because this team will bounce back. I think they got Javier, as a lot of people do. And yeah. by the way, Brian Abreu, I, mean, I don't think there's a guy I'd want to face less. There's not I one mean, human being on planet Earth that I want. It's Joe and Duran Joe and, and, and him. And him. I mean, I, Jack, Jack posted on Twitter, I can't name 10 relievers better than Brian Abreu. I was like, 10? How about three? I said, Yoan Duran. I still would put Devin Williams in the conversation. That's fair. But and in the then, I get postseason, though, I think I'd rather face Devin Williams right now. I think I would, too. It's He is. And it's so funny because Ryan Presley, by the numbers, is one of the greatest postseason relief pitchers of all time. And I am still more afraid of Brian Abreu. He is just. I don't have a word to describe him. He is. He's a different I, I, animal. 
I think he's terrifying. Terrifying. I, I, he's like Jordan on the mound. It's dude, just so the last. It's so much, and it's at you so fast, and it's sliders, and it's ninety-seven with life, and it's a he's big painting. body painting. He's pa- it's painting. So not even including the today's outing. So not even including the outing where he comes in and punches out two out of three. So this would up this this amount. This would up this number, including the last postseason game and then his final five star or appearances of the regular season. He has a zero ERA, forty six percent K rate, which means he has walked or he struck out thirteen in seven and a third innings. And then you add this last outing here, you got a fifty percent K rate just about. He strikes out half the batters he faces. And yeah. again, he elevates himself in the postseason. He he's somebody that I think is going to be just an absolute get out of jail free card for them. I think you could put him in with the bases loaded. I think you could put him in against the team's best hitter. It's gonna take almost blind luck to hit this guy right now. And and you saw the twins start to show some signs of life. And this is my last Astros note. Hunter Brown has not been good through the second half of the season. That's well documented. He didn't look great when he came in. He gave up a run, and that gave them a little bit of momentum there. And what does Dusty Baker do? Yep. Instead of saving Abreu for the eighth or ninth, he knows top of the order is coming up for the Twins. Twins feel like they have a little bit of momentum. It's six to one. You can't count this offense out. The crowd is loud. It's an awesome environment at Target Field, by the way. Twins fans are awesome. But Dusty says, let me shut this shit down real quick and remind them that this is a big deficit. And Abreu comes in and all of that momentum, whack, shut the door. That was it. I felt like that really shut the momentum down when he comes in top of the order and just runs right through those three players right there. To me, that was that was where the game was decided. I know it was six to one, but I felt like they could creep into it at that point. Abreu comes in. It's a wrap. I love that move by Dusty. And again, I mean, that's why that's where the managerial feel comes in here, and I thought that was a perfect example. Such a flex by Dusty. I mean, that's just a manager who has been there for years, and it's not just with the Astros. I feel like he's been managing for, what, four decades at this point, yeah. or at least he seemed like he's been around the game for forever, and it shows there. And, right, we're seeing the experienced managers like Bruce Bochy, and, you know, I don't know how much credit you give Bruce Bochy when the entire lineup goes berserk, and we're going to talk about it in a minute. But one last point to wrap up on this series, and nobody's going to bet this with me. I added more to my position on the twin series. Uh, so I have them at plus 140. I bet that at the beginning of the series. I bet the, them against the Blue Jays. I bet them game one. I bet them game two, and I bet the series price. So we're up a little bit. We got some money to spare here. Right, we're not chasing. I'm up in the postseason. Right, if I was down in the postseason, maybe I wouldn't be as risky. On BetMGM, the Twins to win the series are plus three fifty, and I just want to give you my rationale for making the bet. Now, I didn't put a full unit on it, just a half unit, because I'm already invested in the series. But here's why I did it. So, the Twins open as minus one twenty five favorites to the Houston Astros. It is Jose or Keedy facing off against Joe Ryan and the twins because they got schlacked didn't use much of their bullpen, right? They gave yeah. Griffin Jacks a little bit of work just because he hadn't thrown it a little while, but they have full Brock Stewart, full Caleb field bar. They can go to Varland. They can go to Duran for multiple innings if needed, mm-hmm. because he hasn't thrown in a little bit through seven pitches too the last time he threw. And you have Joe Ryan going up against Jose or Keedy and Brian Abreu just had a little bit of work. Now I assume he's going to be available. And, but the thing is, I assume they put him in if they're winning and then fuck it. The game's over anyway, because then they're going to go to Presley. So and that the game is double over because those two are just unconscious. But if the twins can get a lead here and they win that game, which is not a guarantee guarantee. game five, you got Pablo versus Verlander and anything can happen. And then what I have is 1.5 units to win 3.65. Then what I could do is I can bet on the Astros and get a middle. So I'm looking for value here. If the Twins were plus 180 in this game, right? They had no shot of winning, or at least they were a huge underdog. Like, of course, I'm not going to get that plus 350. But think about it. If they win this game, they'll be short underdogs against the Astros. And we know anything can happen. Game five, like the A's could beat 
the Braves or the Phillies or the, anything can happen in game five. So that's yeah. why I took that position. And I know it sounds crazy because we're sitting here after a nine to one schlacking and everybody on earth thinks this, this series is over and it might be, and I might soak this loss, but I search for value. And that's how we've been profitable in multiple sports. What yeah. do you think about that bet? No, I was, was going to say just from like the pure base, like just all, I can't even speak to the the numbers. And I think the numbers even make it even better of a bet if anyone wants to use the uh, MGM code. But just from like my classic rationale here of why I think the twins are going to work their way back into this. And I didn't even know that you doubled down. That's why I laughed. I was like, oh, you're really believing in it, which I love. Is you mentioned the bullpen. I mean, they they kind of waved the white flag after Abreu came in too, which was which was a funny part of it. Once Maeda gave up another run, it was like, all right, you know, we're 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 gonna throw Ober in here and then get Jack some work. To your point, Jax is very available uh, for the next game. It's gonna be all hands on deck. Duran, as you mentioned, very available. Chris Paddock, very available. Um, and they could even go to Varland as well if they want. Like, they've got all all hands on deck. Everybody's available. And Jose I know Arquita that they're gonna... starting like, do yeah, we remember they're... who that is? Exactly. I, I, and I know he had like two good starts in the season. I don't care there. I think they're going to be able to put up some runs against Sir I think they're that the Astros are going to be able to hit Joe Ryan a little bit. And if it yeah. turns into a bullpen battle, there's some length that the twins have here because Paddock can go multiple. You mentioned Duran can be stretched out a little bit. Uh, they've got jacks. They've got a lot of different guys available and they know if they can just win this game and force that game five, like you mentioned, Anything can happen. And Pablo Lopez is throwing right now like one of the best pitchers on the planet. You saw you saw Johan Santana coming out with the Pablo Lopez jersey. I fucking yeah. love that. Love lo- that. Pablo deserves all of this shit. It's Absolutely. awesome. Uh, but I think that they know that, right? They know that. And that's what an ace does for you. And, and Lopez is, is literally becoming an ace now. And he's become that. And right now he's, I mean, the team feels like that with him. They know if they can just find a way to win game four, they got a shot. So I, I think game four might be one of the best games of the postseason so far, besides that insane Phillies Braves game. I think we have a chance for a really special game. And of course that means it's going to be 20 to nothing and it's going to suck. But I really do think that this final, this game four in Minnesota, right. Is going to be, is going to be a lot of fun. Game four. Uh, or no, Minnesota. no. Was, is it back to Houston? No game four. Am Minnesota two, two, okay. one. And then game five with Pablo, who's been better on the road this season against Verlander, who's also a stud. And most likely, if it gets to that scenario, I bet Astros money line and I get a middle, right? Guarantee myself some money. So that's my point here. And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but there's a lot of podcasts out there that make takes. I'm putting my money where my mouth is, (laughs) right? I believe in the twins. And I am betting on the twins with my own money. Now it's not gambling advice. It's not, but I am putting my money where my mouth is. I so you can it. come at me all you want. Astros fans. You can come at me. Everybody thinks I'm such a loser for making all these bets. Yeah. He loses money already though. Like, I'm he, putting he, my he's paying money the where price. my mouth is. He's paying the price. You don't need to dunk on him as hard. It, eh, it's, people still can. It's kind of funny yeah, sometimes. It's, it's just when it gets personal. It's like, yeah, yeah. I, yeah it's not, not like, very no nice. One, no one forced you to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> Not very nice. Um, I, I, any other thoughts on this on this game? Again, I think it really just was one of those that got away from the Twins pretty quickly there, and and you can't really chalk it no, up I too mean, much else other than that. It's one of the classic, like, I bet on the NFL, too, and we're having a great season in the NFL. It's like a team gets blown out. You bet on them the next game. It's just it's how sports work, right? Yeah. Everyone thought this but, series was over when the Astros won game one, right? Twins battle back. Then they schlack them in game two, and then – the they get schlacked in game three, and then you never know. Twins yeah. probably come in. We got nothing to lose. Nobody expects us to win anyway. We got Joe Ryan. Let's see what we can do. They probably I'm play really a little interested. bit loose, right? I bet Correa I'm... goes to that locker room and saying, why is everybody nervous? Yeah. What do we have to lose? We're supposed to lose. Let's just yeah. go out there and have some fun. I they bet they got lose tomorrow, and you know they might lose, but I think they're going to give it their best shot. I- I'm excited for the for game four. I, and I think they got the monkey off of their back with the, with the win just to get the postseason win already. And, and, and I know they feel like that they can, they can still put up a fight in this one. So I'm excited because the Astros look like the Astros though. And if they get out of this series, it's going to be really fun to, to, to see how they stack up. I would love maybe a Texas battle or something like that, which leads us in to what we are looking at is probably the most likely scenario here is a Texas battle. Uh, again, as we're recording here, it is the bottom of the eighth, so it's still a 7-1 ball game here. 
I want to start with Nate Eovaldi because this guy is such a dog. Such a, I mean, three elbow surgeries, two Tommy Johns, forearm discomfort that just derails what was a Cy Young caliber season. He then comes back, does not look like Nate Eovaldi at all. Doesn't rehab or anything. Just, you know, no rehab starts, just comes right back. Doesn't look good. And then hits the postseason and dominates start one and dominates start two. Seven innings, five hits, one run, no walks, seven Ks, 98 pitches, 76 strikes. Almost an 80% strike rate for Nate Eovaldi. This dude is built for the postseason, but this dude is also just built different because it's amazing what he's been able to overcome. And I, I just, he's so easy to root for. He's such a stud. Um, I bet on the Rangers first five. So made 0. 0.05 units today. Arm as we're recording on Tuesday. Shout out me, 0. 0.05 units. My bookie is submerged in urine. Uh, <laughs> bet MGM, suck it. Just took 0. 0. 0.05 units. Um, no, but I bet on the Rangers through the first five because Nathan Eovaldi showed in his last start against the Rays and the start before that, that the velocity returned. Right. When he first came back from the IL, he was 93 to 94. Just wasn't that same power pitcher. Right. Because he is built on velo. I mean, this was a guy who was touching 100 miles an hour in his early career. Like all he knows yeah. is throwing fuzz and that velo returned. And when that velo returns, he's right back to being that ace. And that's what he showcased against the Orioles. And. I think Nathan Evaldi pitched really, really well. However, I thought Orioles at bats were not very good. I thought they were over aggressive, just like they have kind of been all series. And I know they put up eight runs, but the lights just seemed a little bit too bright for these Orioles, right? There's a difference a little bit in the twins. I feel like there's a lot of patient hitters in their lineup. And it's funny, I the Orioles bats have been patient all season long, but I just felt like they got out of their approach. But it also doesn't help, right? There's context to having poor at-bats when the Rangers put up six immediately and you feel like you have to press. And they did score eight in that game. What I was saying, though, throughout that start, and again, there's context to it, I thought the Orioles put up some piss-poor at-bats. And if your at-bats aren't elite, you have no fucking shot against Nathan Eovaldi. So shout out Nathan Eovaldi. I thought he was magnificent once again. Seven innings, dominant baseball against the Rays in the trop. Then seven innings at home. It was Dean Kramer versus Nathan Eovaldi. Like, who do you I think mean, we're going to bet on? And it was well, just, well, the Orioles, they can't get swept, right? Adley's never been swept. That, that that's the craziest up, narrative. I mean, what me. are we supposed to do here? That was Adley's that was been... unfair, I felt. Yeah. Like, that was just an unfair matchup. What's amazing to me is now you have a Nate Eovaldi who entered this start with a 290 ERA in the postseason, 49 and two-thirds innings, 49 punch outs, eight walks, a 0 0.966 whip. That was entering this one. So you can improve all of those numbers now with the last start that he just had. He is one of the better postseason starters that we have had, you know, over the last couple of decades. Because you not only have the ring in 2018, in which he legitimately carried, carried yeah. the Boston carried. Red Sox. You have a large sample size here of now 56 and two thirds innings of dominance in the postseason on the big stage. I mean, maybe one blow up start mixed in there and it's confidence. It's using that adrenaline to your advantage in the same way that Zach Wheeler does it, where it's I'm not overthrowing. I'm throwing harder and still spotting again, near 80 percent strike rate in this start. Like this guy was locked the hell in and you can make the point. And I agree. The Orioles looked like a young team out there and similar to the twins in experience, but that was something that Nate Eovaldi sensed and just abused. And that was what was so amazing to watch is he started, I think just with a little bit of momentum there. And then you just kind of got the feeling after the second inning of work, this thing's going to be real hard. Even if they didn't score, it's going to be real hard for the Orioles to be able to keep up. And that's exactly what happened. He, I know the Rangers put up a six spot and that helps, but I really think even if they put up two, one, I, I think it would have felt like a lot more with the way Nate Eovaldi looked and the confidence that he was exuding on the mound. Um, I've got my notes from this game that just went final, final score seven to one. The Rangers are moving on, but 
I didn't know if you had anything first. I have, I have a few specific notes on this game that will probably extend into a couple of talking points. Yeah, I, I loved what Ivaldi was doing, but a lot of my notes are on the offensive side. And the Rangers offense feels like the United States military. And the reason I say that is feels like they have all the nukes. They're an overwhelming offense. And I know you're laughing because that's a crazy thing to say. But they have all the nukes. And what I mean by that is you go one through nine in this lineup. It is unrelenting. Like, Semyon hasn't even had that great of a series. And he's still got the double, right? Dude, Nate, cool. Nate Lowe bats seventh. Silver slugger. And one more point on Nate Lowe. I saw this uh, from um, Cespedes Family Barbecue. Uh, Nathaniel Lowe had a pimp job. And I saw Orioles Twitter kind of being like, oh, you're showboating, all that kind of stuff. Just want to clarify that. First home run since August 18th. He had a terrible September. He was hitting third for most of the season, yeah. but they dropped him in the batting order. And then on top of that, his mom is dealing with brain cancer. Yeah. So that moment was for him. That yeah. had nothing to do with showboating. Everything you hear about the guy, like even in post-game pressers, like seems like a really, really nice guy. Like that one was for him. Yeah. No showboating at all. No, it was no, a double 100%. whammy on that one. So shout no, out to Daniel Lowe, man. He earned yeah. that one. What a really, shot. Really happy for him to just, just have that moment. You could tell how much, to your point, that moment meant to him. And in that lineup, though, too, you, you, you got after him, Josh Young, who was two for four. And that's your eight hitter right now. Your eight hitter is Josh Young, all-star Josh Young by the way, is your eight hitter. I, I don't know how many all-stars are batting eighth. I guess you can make the Geraldo Perdomo case, but you know, that's, a, that's a little bit of a different situation. I think that guy sack bunts every time. But but the, man, can he pick it? Shout out Geraldo Perdomo. Oh, he can pick it, and he's a hell of a bunter. Yeah. Him and him and Martin Maldonado can pick it and bunt, and you know, who told you that doesn't matter anymore? Maldonado is one of the great sacrificers in MLB history. <laughs> hey, dude, I told you. I have my high school's record for sacrifices. That's combining fly balls and buns. And you um, played at a really good high school. Well, you know whose record I broke? Who? Griffin Conines. But all of his were just balls that he meant to hit home runs on that fell at the track. <laughs> Mine were a mixture of arm. Oh, we're going to need you to lay one down here. Um, gonna, and a couple of move, move couple lazy fly balls that just went far enough. But when I broke that record, I sent it to him and he's like, okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, he I have the home run even, record, bitch. Like, no, you're like, I didn't even know I had the record. He didn't. He yeah. didn't. But I was just like, I got you on something. But Gunnar Henderson, man, my I have just Gunnar Henderson is a superstar. Yep. And I've seen yeah. I've seen enough. We we did a whole episode on the call up about how you can't take postseason results and elevate rookie perspectives. Like I think Evan Carter might have some ebbs and flows next year. Like no, even I'm, bought he's been I'm bought in. I'm bought in. I just, Even though he's been fantastic, I, just, I do think he's going to have some ebbs and flows. No. Gunnar Henderson, I've seen enough from his stint last year. I've seen enough from his entire season this year. And what he has done against really good pitchers, I, I'm pretty sure he's like two for – I think he's four for five now in his career against Nate Eovaldi. Like, it, it's just amazing what he's been able to do. Uh, and, and I think Gunnar Henderson at this point is going to be one of those guys that kind of takes this team to the next level because – Adley, we talk about him blossoming into a, you know, probably the best catcher in baseball as some other guys get older. Gunnar Henderson's going to blossom into what I think is going to be an MVP candidate. And this team's not going anywhere. Something that kind of resonated in, in, and kind of rung in my head is what you said a few episodes ago about why you thought the Orioles might come up short. You said, I feel like they might just be a little early here. Mm -hmm. And we see that, you know, we saw it with the Kings and the NBA. You see yeah. it across every league all the time. It's just a team is so good in the regular season that they get themselves there a little bit early. And then all of a sudden we almost forget that they got there way earlier than anyone thought they would. Arum. And this team, the over under where they were, they were projected to finish right in last with the Red Sox going into this year. Arum. And people forget that. I made an AL East prediction. Do you know, I'm starting to see edits on TikTok of my voice being like, I think the Orioles are going to finish in last. That's that was my take. <laughs> Do you know how fucking wrong I was? I said on this show, the Orioles are going to finish in last place. And what did they do? First. Bombarded the rest of the league, finish in first place. They were ahead of the window. This was not supposed to happen, people. 
So, and I posted on Twitter, Orioles fans, I know it's a gut punch because it's been a lot of shit for a really long time. And they won 100 games. And they won 100 games. So you had all the hype, right? But remember, this is what I think. And Michael Elias has got to get his head out of his ass and go get some pitching. And I really hope they do that. And we keep saying it. And we've been saying it for years. And I hope it finally happens. But if it does happen, this is the start of a dynasty. Kyle Bradish has developed into an ace-level pitcher. Maybe he's not a true ace, but he's an elite number two. Grayson Rodriguez looks the part of an ace. But he went up against the Buzzsaw Rangers, right? right? The U.S. military of offenses. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not blaming any of these Orioles pitchers for running into the Buzzsaw. So they didn't, I think, got a good look at their team because if you didn't run into a hot Rangers team, you could have made it even farther. Yeah. You might have just ran into the team that wins the World Series. Yeah. So what I said at the beginning was – This is year one of what I think will be a decade-long run of incredible Orioles success consistently atop the division. I think they're going to win a World Series in the recent, in the distant, eh, the recent future. Near future. Near future. There we go. I'm not a wordsmith. I'm a ball. It's also 11 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. It's also 11 o'clock p.m. Eastern. So I'm already not a wordsmith and it gets late. I mean, you're just getting my full thoughts here. The Orioles are in year one of what I think is a 10-year-long run of incredible success. They just got here earlier than expected, and they ran into a buzzsaw. So if I'm an Orioles fan today, it hurts. I totally get it. If I were you, I would be throwing all logic out the window. I would have thought we'd won the World Series. We won 106 games. We got Adley Rutschman, who's never lost a series in his freaking life, it seems like, probably dating back to his time at Oregon State. And he came up short. You can put a lot of blame at the same time, like, retool, go get another pitcher, and you'll be back next year and the year after, and the year after, and the year after. It's going to be a decade-long run of success for the Orioles. I'm with you, and I totally agree. And what, honestly, it boils down to for me, though, and I think this series is kind of a microcosm of why the Orioles came up just a hair short. We got criticized and ridiculed for saying that the Orioles had a really bad trade deadline. Yeah, And And, we don't like to bring up takes like that unless we get killed for them. And it doesn't just even start with the deadline, right? And and part of it, what it boils down to for me in this series, like it's almost a beautiful microcosm of the entire situation, is the three starting pitchers that go for the Texas Rangers were either acquired in the offseason leading into the season or were traded for at the deadline. I give them the benefit of the doubt because a lot of the deadline acquisitions were ass this year. Like a lot of the deadline acquisitions were not good, but that's go. why you have to do one or the other, do one or the other. They got Ivaldi in the off season. Andrew Heaney, I know had ups and downs this year, but they could have definitely used him. He'd be better than anything that they were using today. And he that's what it boils down to the Orioles. Me. He won a game against the Orioles. I mean, he didn't pitch all that great, but like, no, I mean, he gave him starter. three, he gave him three and two thirds quality inning better than better what than they got from Dean Kramer. Yeah. yeah. So that's what it boils down to for me is like, you could have done more. I get it. You exceeded expectations. That's all great. And hopefully now they finally look in the mirror here and say, we literally came up short to a team that added three arms that we could have feasibly added. And that's where you got to look in the mirror and say, Hey, okay, when are we going to finally do this? When are we going to finally be serious about this? Because when you have a winner go home game and you're starting Dean Kramer, piggybacking Tyler Wells and Kyle Gibson, like that, how you're supposed to go home at that point. Yeah. And you the are. irony of it is opposite of you as an eight year Valdi, who I know they paid pretty handsomely, but not that much. You can't tell me the Orioles couldn't afford that. And I know he got hurt and I know he had some issues, but look at what he's doing right now in the postseason and look at what he did in the first half. I really feel like that ended up being the biggest difference maker here. And I know j wasn't spectacular, but he helped them get here. He helped the, preserve the bullpen. And you know what? They would have taken four innings of four-run ball, too. They and, they would add a shot in that and game, Jaymont, too. Jaymont was amazing against the Tampa Bay Rays. And we talk about the Orioles having the best farm system in Major League Baseball. But you traded for Jack Flaherty on his team, so you definitely were on the phone with Mose Locke. Couldn't have done it. With you have 17 short stops in your minor leagues, yeah. you couldn't have done it. No, be better than that. And that's and, what we keep saying about the Orioles. We know it's there. Orioles fans know it's there. And it's so funny. It's like it's the elephant in the room. There is nobody on planet Earth who has a different take about the Orioles. No, just go get pitching. One more thing, Arm. 
Yeah. Why didn't they start Tyler Wells? I thought the whole handling of Tyler Wells, and maybe I'm maybe I don't know the whole story, and it's on yeah. me for not doing enough research here. And I know he got up to 118 innings the year before. He's only at 100, so maybe it was some sort of innings concern. But he's a big boy, right? Like, why are we just continuing to limit his innings? And then you're pulling up and you're pitching him anyway. Tyler Wells is better than Dean Kramer. I'm sorry. I mean, I don't yeah. even know if Orioles fans would disagree. Like no. the numbers say that Tyler no. Wells is better than him. And I'm a Tyler Wells guy. Well, and, and also the opener. I mean, that's even if he only goes one or or, or or two innings, that's the buzzsaw part of the lineup. I know the whole lineup's good, but those are the hardest outs to get sometimes, you know, when we're talking about the first three innings. It doesn't matter doing an opener against the Rangers. What? Because then you got like Jonah Heim, who's just such a beast too. I mean, he's such a I beast. Know. <laughs> it just could have gone a little bit better, I think, for Kramer if he's not opening up against Semi and Seeger and then Garver and and, and realistically and though, I'm saying Tyler Welsh should have started. Wouldn't have mattered. Literally. I don't think it would. No, it wouldn't. I, matter. I, Especially I, with the I way actually, Evaldi threw. When the Rangers are hitting like that, and you got to start like that from Evaldi, there's nobody on. I I I will say this: there is no team in Major League Baseball that can beat them. They are more prolific than the Braves' offense when they are hot. They are more prolific than the Phillies when they are hot. That's what we've been saying about the Rangers. The, the reason we weren't super bullish on them going into the postseason, you know, we did pick them against the Orioles, but I thought because they got hot, because I thought that they would lose the race, right? They scuttled in. So that's why I've been watching this team all year. If you've been listening to the show all season, you know, I've been the most hot and cold guy on the Rangers this whole season. I keep hyping them up to the mountaintops when they're hot. And then I shit on them when they're cold because they look like trash. They look like trash going in, but then they get hot. And I'm back to the same point. If they are hot, there is no team in Major League Baseball that can beat them. Yeah, no, I'm with you. And they're looking like that right now. And they're about to get Max Scherzer back. And they've got, you know, and again, no one expected Ivaldi to pitch like this. They, The outlook is totally different right now. And that's extremely exciting. I have a couple notes from this game. One is Corey Seager is getting the Barry Bonds treatment, yep. which is absolutely insane. And he walked in three games here in this series against the Orioles, walked nine times. <laughs> that, that, that in itself is insane. Nine most walks. In, most in postseason history in a three-game span per Sarah Langs. And, which is insane. And then beyond that, when he gets a pitch hit, not missing it. 450-foot bomb today. It, Did it's he just get all of that? Do you think he got all of that? I didn't even think he got all of it. He had 450. I, I think he might have, but it didn't <laughs> look like it. it. It's low but effort. It looked very you know, effortless, Not, nonchalant, a hundred percent. My other note is the nerdiest thing that no one gives a shit about, but they will next year. I can't DL, DL hall found it. DL oh. hall changed his delivery. He's instead of being more upright, he's more down driving out of that back. Like we're talking about, you know, what Chapman kind of did. That's an exaggerated example. Think of a middle ground there. DL hall found it. He's been pounding the strike zone and he came in in relief in this one again, Inning in two thirds, scoreless, three Ks. I'm just just wanted to mention one silver lining here. DL Hall will be one of the best relievers in Major League Baseball next year as long as he stays healthy. I think he fully, fully, fully found it. That's one positive note there. I had that. I had to circle that one because I've watched now a handful of outings and broke down some video going into this one. And when they when they put him in, I was like, let's go. I, I wanted to see one more DL Hall appearance. So he's found it. And and that's another good arm in their bullpen to have. Um, the other than bullpen, that, the Orioles bullpen lab is insane. Do you think my question for you? Do you think he can start, or you think? I mean, you said best reliever. Yeah, I mean, he was a starter. I think I think it's one of those things where it's like you finally found a way to make him incredibly valuable. You know, you, they was trying to find it in the rotation. I I think keep him in the pen and and let him just be that multi inning reliever. Him, Maybe Kano opener from time to time. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they did the same disgusting. thing with Fujinami, right? They put him in the bullpen and he becomes this just electrifying arm. Now, I know he wasn't as great down the stretch and who knows what he's going to be. But if he's your fifth, sixth inning guy, like the other guy at the bottom insane. of the bullpen, I mean, come on. This bullpen it's could be insane. the best in baseball next year. That's why we're so bullish. Like, you will have, you might have the best bullpen in baseball. You'll have a young and exciting offense. It's all good on defense and just gets more pitching. And you have Bradish and Grayson, so it's not like you need to go spend $200 million dollars. But why why couldn't they go get Yamamoto? They won't. There, we there's know no reason they not won't. to. They're gonna well because John Angelus is gonna cry broke, and yeah. that's. I mean, Aaron Nola would be a great fit because that's a guy that you know all of those expected stats. Like 
But you're going to a place now where the ball is really hard to hit out. Like home runs are an issue for him. And that place is really hard to hit home runs in. Like, you know, he's going to eat innings. You know, at the very least, he's going to still be quality. Like, he's still going to give you something in the low fours. He's still good. He's still good. Like that, I would love to see them do it. They they probably won't. We'll see what happens. But I feel great about this team long term. I I guess the last to wrap up really is now how do you recalibrate with the Texas Rangers? Because I feel like, to your point, I've recalibrated on the Texas Rangers three times this year. And, And I think we all have. I think the whole baseball community is recalibrated in terms of they're the best. They're the worst. They're somewhere in between. And now they're the best again. So this might be the fourth recalibration. I mean, with Eovaldi throwing like this, and we already know what Jamon's capable of. I'm, yeah, if, if his worst start was four on four, like I'll take that. I think he's going to be better next time out. And then whatever they get from Scherzer, man, like that, that's exciting to just get him back. And we talked about the offense. I mean, let's assume that it's Rangers Astros, even though we think the twins have a great chance. Cause I, if it's Rangers twins, I love the, the Rangers in that one. I mean, you got to feel like that's got to be one of the better series that we've had in some time. Like that could be an absolute banger aside from the Texas on Texas narrative. Yeah, it's tough because I want to say, yeah, the Rangers are going to roll through whoever they face. I said that they are the best team remaining if they are hot. However, if those two teams meet, like if those two teams meet, you assume that the Astros offense stayed hot, right? because they just put up nine, then yeah. if they beat the piss out of Joe Ryan, because you assume that the Twins are going to score against Urquidy, I mean, playoff baseball, he probably throws a freaking no-hitter through five innings. That's just how it is, right? Sonny Gray is a lot of eight home runs this year. He lost two. But before the game happens, you assume that the Twins would hit Urquidy. So if the Astros then win, that probably means the offense is hot. That's an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object. I mean, that's going to be basically the World Series. That is Philly's Braves, right? And we've seen how competitive that series is. So my gut says I still think the Rangers roll against whoever they face. However, they haven't had all that much success against the Astros, even when they were hot during the regular season. The Astros have kind of been their one bugaboo, yeah. kind of like the Phillies and the Braves, right? Braves are the best team ever, but the Phillies kind of have their number a little bit. It'll be one of those series, probably go seven. And then anything could happen in game seven. It's going to be one of those. It's going to be clash of the Titans. Yeah. And I cannot wait. However, twins are moving past. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I mean, I, I don't, I don't believe it truly, but, but I, I the, do believe- the, the twins are my Cinderella team. They're getting steamrolled by the Rangers. If the Rangers stay hot, which I think I, they will. I think they find a way to go to go, you know, get this thing to five. We'll wrap up just with the games that are coming up you know, and that people will be watching later today, starting off with, I, did I see it properly? I, I was working and like, I was scrolling through Twitter. Chuck Morton going to get the, the ball here. Is is Chuck Morton going to get activated and go? It still hasn't been announced yet. And that's why I'm waiting. It's either going to be Bryce Elder or it's going to be Chuck. Um, I'd rather, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather diminish Chuck. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. If, if it's a diminished Chuck versus Aaron Noah, the Braves, they like Aaron Noah. They've seen him plenty. They should be able to handle business against Noah. I didn't think Noah looked as sharp as the stat line would say against the Agreed. Marlins. I thought the Marlins kind of just sucked. And also yeah. the zone was very I was, generous. I was going to say that. I thought the yeah. Marlins just sucked. Yeah, they were just kind of ass. And also we're talking about a guy throwing everything heavy and he was getting two balls below. Again, credit to Noah for abusing yeah. that. And he he was a, he, that's what a good pitcher does. But I don't know if it's going to work the same way. And momentum with the Braves that I, they need Morton. And I think they know, I think they know that if they get even four or five innings from Morton, they can be in a really good spot here. So that's a fun one to, to start things off. And then we kind of previewed it already. Seven o'clock game, Joe Ryan, Jose Arquiti. We both think that the twins pull that one out. Well, what and I will then, say just before we, just before we move on, I agree. The Braves can hit Nola. Braves are coming into the bank. That's a tough one. Now, yeah. truest, right? We talk about the bank all the time. Phillies fans love to talk about the bank. The chop with all those fans yelling. I mean, that is also an incredibly Gary. good place to play at home. I hope, please split these two games. 
please let the Braves win one. Please let the Phillies win one. As baseball fans, we deserve a game five. We I wish these. It. I wish these series would go seven. I get it. You can't have a World Series like when it's snowing. Like it's it's just have them be play better. every day for a month. Like yeah. <laughs> I would, I'd watch every inning, every I, strike. I this is the best. Braves Phillies is the best. I think a big solution to this the whole division series upset thing that everyone's so upset about would be more games, seven game series, harder to you know punch someone in the mouth and catch them off guard. Speaking of which, the Dodgers. Final game here, nine o'clock tomorrow or today, as people are listening. Lance Lynn versus Brandon Fott. I think that poor Brandon Fott is going to get murdered out there. Seems. I like hope he throws well. Seems like it, right? You think he shoves? Uh, no, but I mean the Dodgers bats—they're swinging dead bats up there. Mookie Betts is so in between, and Freddie Freeman is so in between. If Mookie Betts doesn't get a base hit to open the game, they're probably going to lose. Like, well, I think I, you would think it makes all the sense in the world, right? Dodgers, of course, they're going to hit Brandon Fott. Of course they are. Brandon Fott's been terrible. Brandon Fott's been destroyed by them in the past. What reason do we have to believe that the Dodgers are just going to snap out of it here? Do you know what, do you know what their batting average is through two games? As Zero. a team? 159. They, they can't are- 10 for 63 with 16 strikeouts. I will say this is the one opportunity for them to, to tee off because Fott is just a guy that's going to need to, you know, kind of adjust things in the off season. I still believe in him. We've talked about it, but like he's going to need to shuffle some things around. Lance Lynn, I don't think is going to be, be twirling a gem either though. This is a game where I think it's going to be fireworks and you can just, you know, put your head on the pillow, turn the TV on, and just listen to home run calls left and right. Because I think this is going to be a shootout uh, arm, between both I wanted of these to bet teams. the over, but like, are, so we're confident here in the Dodgers hitting. Are we? Because Brandon Fott can just throw fastballs away to Mookie, and like he's just not hitting them. I think like you would I think, think they find it. I think they find it in this one. I do. I think, think the bats come alive. You think, think the bats come I'm alive. probably going to bet on it and lose a unit. Probably because I'm going to be like, yeah, the over makes all the sense in the world, and they're going to lose four two. Like, yeah, and then people are DMing me. We have to go on the Dodgers, right? I'm like, fuck no, I'm not laying the juice on. I'm that. not laying the Dodgers, but I I do think that there's going to be some fireworks in this one, and and that should be a great way to end out. But it's going to be a fun slate tomorrow. A also, little bit of desperation, a little bit of parody. I, it's it's all good stuff across the board. Any final thoughts, Peter? As we wrap up, I'm excited. Obviously. Uh, to hopefully get a couple more games out of these series. I, I do think that they're going to all get extended here. Um, the ones that can be uh, tomorrow. So I, I, and I hope that that's wishful thinking, but I also believe it. I just want to, man, I, I just feel so bad for doubting the D backs because yeah, me too, but it's just such a fun team. And I wish in hindsight, of course, I wish we were all on them against the Brewers fraud of a team I yeah, mean, just I every year like why couldn't the diamondbacks beat them gallon is so good kelly is awesome. so good the bullpen has been great tori lovello is pushing all the right buttons the offense is just overwhelming right now they're fast they're playing fearless i just paul that's seawald my biggest was one regret. of the best acquisitions paul seawald was unbelievable unbelievable how about getting lordy scurriel jr and gabby moreno for dalton varsho i mean just yeah. an unbelievable trade and at the time we were like yeah it's expensive we love varsho i mean no they killed that trade so my biggest regret of this postseason is not being in on the Diamondbacks early. They are so much fun. And you know what? I, ho- I hope they beat the Dodgers. Because like, I do too, but I want more games. I, I want know more that's games. a good point. I do want, I just want more baseball. So like, I I'm hope down for the D backs to win it, but like yeah, win it at home. That's a good point. That's a good point. I just want more baseball. I is want it, every it, series to go five. Yeah. That, that's, that's, I love high leverage ball. I, it's at Arizona though. So I guess they would, they could win this one at home, but then they'd have another chance to win it at home if they lose it. Obviously, you don't want that thing going back to Chavez Ravine uh, for a game five. So don't give a like, shit about Chavez Ravine. They don't yeah. give a shit. Like, I mean, <laughs> they don't care. Yeah, it's true. They just actually just boat race them there for two. Yeah. So I- I'm excited. We'll see what happens. It- it's going to be, I think, a couple fun games in Arizona. And I'm excited to see that place packed. We haven't seen Chase Field packed like that in a minute. So, it, it you know, it should be a, a nice opportunity to see baseball kind of gain some more life out there because this is another team that's not going anywhere anytime soon. So I'm looking forward to, uh, again, seeing Arizona packed and, and 
fans really getting behind this team and hopefully building, you know, sustainable, you know, a fa- sustainably growing fan base out there because it's been so cool seeing Minnesota, you know, kind of rally back around their guys. Same thing with Baltimore and same thing. I think that's going to happen here in Arizona for the foreseeable future as this team doesn't go anywhere. Any final thoughts as we wrap up? No final thoughts for me. So excited for more baseball tomorrow. And we will also be back tomorrow to do the same thing. Recap all the games, preview the next day's games. And if you've enjoyed the postseason, we stay up late to give you these episodes. It's our job and we freaking love it. And we hope that you love it too. If you could rate and review on five stars, we would greatly appreciate it. It's the best way to support the show. Written reviews helps us a ton. And on YouTube, again, comment, like, subscribe. And if you want to get yourself some Just Baseball merch, hats, tees, sweatshirts, polos, it's all in the episode description. And all of this is brought to you by our friends at BetMGM. Remember, people, if you're a degenerate like me and you like the point, sprinkle on the twins. If you've been betting with me this entire time, we're up. So we got a little money to play with. Why don't you believe in something, ladies and gentlemen, for once in your damn lives, just believe in something. And I believe believe in the the twins twins, and I'm willing to die on the sword. I believe twins fans do not give up hope. I believe now if they lose, you know, we'll pivot, right? We'll spin zoned it another way, but that was a great time. Aram, I'm Peter with that. Thank you, everybody.